someone has a birthday. And guess what? It's us. <laughs> this November marks one year that the Prose Garden has been bringing you the very best in prose readings. Hard to believe it's been one entire year since Meg Pokers and I started welcoming true stars of prose, be it Flash, Longer Stories, CNF, and Prose Poetry. And we have some, we've had some amazing times. We really have. And not only have we had wonderful readers, but we've had the good fortune to welcome so many of you to the Zoom room and to you who watch or even rewatch the replay later at your leisure. Meg and I cannot thank you enough. So welcome to today's show. I am Francine Witt in New York City. My fellow host is Meg Pokris in the UK. We have a great lineup for you today. So sit back and relax and enjoy our November harvest in the Prose Garden. So just to warm up um, the Zoomosphere, Oh, I see in the chat, people at the birthday cake say thank you. <laughs> um, Thanks. So um, I'm going to read a couple of micros. We'd like to do that just so that, you know, uh, nobody's thrown to, feels thrown to the wolves first. I'll throw myself to the wolves. This is called Boy and Museum. A boy stands at the foot of a hill. Craggles of rock and dust blend into the gray of his age. Too old, not old enough. For a moment, it all seems museum to him. Everything he does, an artifact. He wonders what kind of exhibit he is and what wing of the building he will end up in. He doesn't realize that everyone, not just him, thinks they will be remembered. This is the, there is the tiniest opening in the air just above him and he starts to climb. He wants to see where the carve of his face will be, a sharp taloned ink Sharp talons eagle flies by, snatches the boy's future in its beak. His parents wait for him at the top of the hill. The mother's arms would reach down to help him, but they are filled with another child. The father has a cell phone in one hand, his own glory days in the other. The boy wonders how he can go anywhere now that the eagle has taken his future. Rather than start a climb, he figures he can always start later because museums are ancient and take eons to form. He tries to find that spot in the air, that open sleeve to find the bird that flew the future away from him. The boy's useless hands waving the air to see where it opens. At the top of the hill, his parents' arms wanting to wave, but not. And then the second one, second one is called, uh, I like to call it sleep. And I just want to say, I don't write memoirs, just so, you know, just so you know. I like to call it sleep. Once my father slept for two months, the doctors called it a coma. Today is the first day of Frankie never calling again. At first, I kept waiting for my father to wake up. The doctor said I should have faith. I watched a machine forcing air in and out of my father's lost body. I knew this was the first day of his death. I thought Frankie was different. Sensitive guy, listened to me, made me believe that was before. Now I'm watching the phone, waiting for it to ring. Just wake up and ring. When I was a kid, my father would snore when he slept, shake the house, thin crackery walls, Sometimes my little sister and I would wake up from the crush of the sound. We thought it was a monster. I remember sitting across from Frankie in the coffee shop. We ordered coffee till we could float. He just listened, sat and listened when I told him we could only be friends. My father was a monster. We were really only safe when he slept. The snoring was scary. The not snoring was scarier. One day, I wasn't looking and Frankie took my heart right out of my purse, my fault for leaving it open. One day I wasn't looking and my father bruised my mother so bad she had to go to the emergency room. They sent her home with a cookie. Over there on the desk, the clock is ticking. The clock keeps ticking no matter what, no matter what else stops. 
That breathing machine moved my father's chest up and down, up and down. The clock is saying, tick tock, you fool, you fool, tick tock, tick tock. I stopped going to the hospital to see my father. I got tired of watching. Someone who was there told me he just quietly closed his eyes. I know how never calling again begins. Men leave such a trail of quiet. You just hear it and hear it. The thing about death, the thing about death. I know he's gone. I know what it is, but I like to call it sleep. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it over to my fellow host over in the UK, the wonderful Meg Pogris. Thank you so much, Francine. Those were absolutely beautiful. Um, I'll read a couple from my new collection, which is hard to see with the filter. The first law of holes from Dijank Books. Um, the first one is a, a teen piece. I, I used to write quite a lot of stories in a teenage voice. It's called Sex in Siberia. My imaginary man lives in Siberia. We touch down on each other like helicopters. I smile, move my mouth around him, offer a warming hut. When he bursts, storm clouds open. Southern California boasts mild, featureless people. The Weather Channel's talking heads, all Botoxed and baby fatted in their cheeks, ramble on about radical snowstorms in New York State. I paint leaves, collect styrofoam in buckets. Driving downtown for wrapping paper, I count the fake blondes wearing $2 Santa Claus hats. My parents divorced and nobody yells anymore, but that is no longer important. I want a Siberian life, a Siberian husband, one whose hair changes from brown to light. My dog seems worried, so he and I take long walks. Sweat trickles down my back. The dog pants miserably. I promise him someday we'll skate alongside a large man who loves labs. In December, I slump into bed early. Imagine what it will be like, Siberian sex, better than any other kind. So cold outside, so warm under the covers. I ball up socks and rub them where the man would go. We're there, and he is teaching me how to taste snow. And the next one is called Alligators at Night. You remember when you lived in Florida briefly, walking to the store with your husband in the middle of the night? You remember the sound of alligators crooning like deranged nocturnal cows all the way to the 7-Eleven from each side of the highway. You remember thinking they must regularly sing to people on their way to the 7-Eleven, mostly a welcome sound because there's a three hour walk there and the three hour walk home and the night sky is so velvety in the summer and the singing alligators are like jazz. It's like you're in a jazz club, but walking outside. Walking to the 7-Eleven, what you sometimes want is to never actually get there because you're holding hands, feeling his warm, fine skin. He has not yet had his dose of whiskey and his breath has not yet become thick as a mushroom cloud. You have not yet said you have a migraine and that you don't really feel like snuggling because your body is so sweaty after the six hour walk. You have not yet cried or threatened to leave and you have not yet been quieted by your husband with his body half asleep and given up the fight. You remember that your walk to the 7-Eleven is glorious. You are both present, but so quiet. The two of you loving the sound of strange overgrown creatures who are so close to you, but attached to their watery homes. Sometimes you imagine these animals are chasing you and your husband all the way to the 7-Eleven, but mostly you just think of them there in the dark without alcohol and probably without love. Thanks. And I will turn it back to my wonderful host, uh, Francine Witt. Well, those are amazing, Meg. Uh, where can we buy your wonderful book? Um, well, pretty much anywhere uh, online, online booksellers, and then you can order them from your local bookstore. And I know they're around in stores. I just, I don't know which stores they're in, which is kind of frustrating, but they've been cited. They've yes. been cited recently. I got real excited in New York, but yeah, I don't I know. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and I know that bookstore. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. They're, 
That's and what it is. Um, yeah. It's a it's a great bookstore down on uh, I think it's Orchard Street. And um they also do podcasts there. And it's it's really nice and they do readings and so a lot of eyes will be on your book. So so cool. Yeah. Well, I'm congratulations on that, Meg. Thank so, you so much. Okay. So we'll hear more from Meg later. Um so for right now, I'm gonna introduce uh, the first group of readers. Catherine Silverhajo. Catherine Silverhajo's work appears in many lovely journals, most recently Unbroken, Ghost Parachute, Ghost Parachute, Gooseberry Pie, Bull, Your Impossible Voice, and was selected for the 2023 and 24 Wigleaf Top 50 Long List and nominated for Best of the Net, Pushcard, Best Microfiction, Best Small Fictions, and Best American Food Writing. Books include award-winning Flash Collection, Wolf Song, and the YA novel, Roots of the Banyan Tree. Welcome, Catherine Silverhaja. Thank you so much, Francine. I'm so grateful to be here with such wonderful readers and this fabulous audience. I'm seeing many friends. It's lovely to be here. So I'm going to start with a flash, and then I'll just read a few short micros after that. And this one appeared a few months ago in Ghost Parachute. Spinning. Nona and Nono never speak to Gran and Gramps, never visit. Mom and dad joke it's like trying to mix Prosecco and Jack Daniels, eyeball roll. I like my visits with Nona and Nono way better. The way they give me red wine with dinner, usually lasagna since they know it's my favorite. But this time, mom made me stay the week with her parents while she and dad go on their anniversary getaway to Cape Cod. Now it's all make your bed and brush your teeth and eat all that dry, bland chicken and carrots on your plate if you want us to let you watch one hour of TV before bed, bletch. Today I'm doing laundry since just because you're a guest doesn't mean you get out of chores. Why couldn't I stay with dad's parents? Anyway, I'm short, right? Even at 14 years old, five feet on a good day, if I'm rocking platform shoes. Thing is, they have this ginormous washing machine with a drum that's like three and a half feet deep, I swear. So I have to use a step stool to get high enough to lean over and get all the clothes out. And I fucking fall in. And the lid slams shut after me and Gran and Gramps are out playing bridge or golf or some lame thing like that. And I'm alone in the house with their yappy little shih tzu. I know that's not how you spell it, thank you. Anyways, I'm freaking out trying to climb the sides when it starts spinning, and I mean fast. I'm so dizzy I could puke, but I somehow managed to hold it down, and then the curve of the drum is like an IMAX theater all around me. And first I see Gran's granny underwear that would fit a whale flying around my head, and Gramps' disgusting stained boxers and my own jean, shirts, jean shorts and Beyonce t-shirts whizzing by. Then I start seeing everyone in the washer with me, wearing their own clothing. Even Nona and Nono are there. They're arguing and Nona's saying she smelled Gran's perfume on Nono's pajamas, Shalimar. Her right eyebrow arches up high when she says this. And Nono pointing his temple saying she's Patsa, flicking his hand like he thinks he can shoo Nona away like a fly, shut her up. But no one shuts Nona up. And her hands are waving, her face red as the beets she pickles. And meanwhile, I'm IMAX watching Gran in her bedroom just down the hall from where I'm stuck in this crazy carnival ride. And she has her hands over her eyes and Gramps pulls his belt out, holds it over her. And I try to scream, no, Gramps, no. But nothing comes out. And I smell the Shalimar in her granny bra that's hooked itself over my ear. And my head is spinning along with my feet. And Gran is crying and hanging her gray head that turns all ground curls as she zooms around me. And Nono's sag saggy sleeveless undershirt flies off and his pot belly is gone. And there's no more Gramps snarling and snapping. No Nona with her warm hands curving around my chin, calling me Bella. No more me even, just Nono and Gran him bare-chested in tide-scented cotton, cotton bottoms, her in a low-cut silk thing, and no granny underwear. No underwear at all, actually. I feel sick again. Wish I could climb out of this thing, bolt from the house, and never come back. But I'm stuck here with Nono and Gran smooching, and worse. And I can never unsee it. 
And now I know my parents saying that shit about mixing Prosecco and Jack Daniels is a cover up just to try and make a joke out of something that's not funny. And I hear the shitty Shih Tzu squeal like a hysterical hyena when the front door slams shut and Gran and Gramps come in arguing as usual. And now I want to stay here with the soggy clothes and not have to face any of them except maybe Nona refuse to grow up to be anything like them even though their DNA will be hurtling around inside my cells like a whirlpool forever. And there's nothing I can do to stop it. Thank you. So I'm just gonna read three very short little father themed uh, micros. And the first of these was published in Dribble Drabble Review. 8,000 miles to Hanoi. My dad, long hair tied back, pulls the tent flap aside. I'm coiled cozy in my sleeping bag, cushioned on a pine needle bed, a chill still in the mountain air, distant howling, rustle of leaves, water rushing, shushing. He coaxes me outside with cocoa in a blue enameled cup. We warm hands and feet over the smoldering fire, aroma of coffee rising from dying embers. Fog clouds the valley below. A hawk glides, draws our eyes down. And there, rising ghostly from the mist, a B-52 bomber shears up and over the highest peak, hushing us silent as rubble. And this next one um, is was recently printed in print in Blink Ink's lovely little volume that came out recently, the Summer Nights uh, edition. And it's called Stargazing, Lama, New Mexico. Imagine pristine air, moonless night, no light, the midnight sky teeming. So many stars, they seem to fuse into one great fishing net across the sky. Soft wafts of sage and smoke, a dog's bark echoing across the mountain, the press of my father's hand, warm on my shoulder, still. Thank you. And then the last one uh, was published recently in Paragraph Planet, The Cubist. George grieves with the old maple as leaves drop through dappled light, orange, red, yellow. He'll never again embrace Zelda's soft warmth, tangle on the sofa with Spotty, the kids, and her to read Ozma of Oz. He knows sometimes she fe felt neglected, but never imagined the molten core that would explode, blowing them all skyward. Now he gathers shards to piece together a mosaic as disjointed, colorful, and chaotic as a Picasso. That's it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank um, you. Thanks. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's like a real uh, art, like a very difficult task to like get everything down to 50 or 75 or even 100 words. And you did that so beautifully. Oh, thank you. I love a good. I love a good shitty Shih Tzu story. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so so, Catherine, where can we get your books? Uh, probably the easiest thing is to go to my website, which okay. I will type real quick. Put that in the chat. Silverajo.com. So and there are links there. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us here Thanks in for the having Rose me. Garden. Wonderful, Catherine Silverajo. Um, okay, uh, Cheryl Pappas is the author of the flash fiction collection, The Clarity of Hunger, published by Word West Press 2021. Her work has appeared in Swamp Pink, Wigleaf, Cadence Ferry Review, Smoke Long Quarterly, The Chattahoochee Review, and elsewhere. She is a 2023 McDowell Fellow and is currently at work on a novel, Cheryl Pappas. Pappas. Welcome to the Press Garden. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Fran and Meg, for hosting this wonderful um, Prose Garden anniversary 
birthday special. Um, I'm really happy to be reading with everyone today. Um, I'm going to be reading a story from The Clarity of Hunger. Um, this recently came back to my mind because I wrote this story, this flash, um, during the first Trump presidency. So, um, and just a little note, there's alternating text. So one is straight Roman text, and then there's interspersed italicized text. So you'll notice a change in tone of my voice. It's called The Golden Apple. There will be a ruler of a kingdom of the last women, a man, of course. He will have countless female subjects in his desolate territory on the western end of the globe. They will not know his name, but they will feel his presence. A woman pierces the cold, packed dirt with her shovel. The sound of metal on earth is an ancient song. Zing, zing. The man will send messages in the sky every morning. You are nothing and that is everything. Or be the worm in the golden apple. All the women will hate him with the fire of a thousand suns, but they'll do what he says. They will work the dirt in their fenced off square plot of land that is already dead and will keep going in spite of everything. They will keep not seeing. It is noon and she is waist deep in the hole now. She won't eat a crumb until it's done. When the man has grown very old and very tired, his messages will become more enigmatic. He will say things like, the great sea is at bay, or I am terrified. In the dark, she has built a room to walk around in. The sun and sky seem miles away. She makes a little shelf and mounts it on the wall. She lights a candle and places it on the shelf. The room blooms with the scent of rosemary and honey. She drinks water from a hidden cup of stars in her coat. The women will in turn become shaken. They will work the infertile ground harder, yet they will be no closer to water. She sweeps the floor, props the broom up against the wall, and sits cross-legged. She closes her eyes. She waits. The next day, there will be no message. In the morning, a sea of upturned faces. By noon, women will wander their empty plots, and by evening, they'll wonder who they are and what they are doing. The next day, a message will arrive. It's not long now. Find me the golden apple, and you will rule my glorious kingdom, you of all people. She fills around in her coat pocket and pulls out an orange. She peels a piece of the skin. The women, energized by this new task, will stand on top of their fences and look out, but will see only more plots. They will jump down into each other's plots and hatch plans. A few of them will be suspicious. Who is the golden apple? Do you? What is that in your pocket? Every once in a while, a scream will erupt after a clang of shovel and blood will seep into the dirt. She peels another piece of the orange. One woman will say to another, I've been secretly unhappy. And the other woman will be relieved and say that she has been unhappy too. A new message will be written on the sky. A clue, the golden apple is beyond the plots where I live. Beyond the plots, beyond the plots, one woman will whisper. At once, all the women will stand on their fences and look for miles around. In the east, out of nowhere, will rise a tree, stretching toward the sun. It will grow impossibly tall, and bright specks of orange will blossom in it. She peels another piece, letting the skin fall to the earth. The flame in her candle grows stronger. The woman will start walking across the fences toward the tree, shovels in hand. She starts humming a little song. It will take all day to get to the tree. The first woman to arrive will find an old man sitting against the tree trunk. He will be wearing dirty clothes and will have no teeth. One woman will jump down and ask, it's only you, you, you weak little thing. She will look behind her as hundreds of women come up at the end of the last fence. So you've come. 
His laugh will fill the air with thunder, but will fade into a cough. Go on, then. Try to find it. A ladder will appear next to him. I won't stop you. His voice will sound as if it's being choked by dust. The woman will stare at him a moment and raise her shovel. The other women will jump down. The metal will glisten like shark teeth. Another peel falls to the floor, a slight chill. The ladder, here, waiting. He will hold the saw in his quivering hand, poised at the first step. He will smile and whisper, I dare. The first woman will strike. Then the shovels will move in unison and the woman will stop only when there is a bloody, dusty pulp left on the earth and some tattered clothes. One will think to bury him. She will dig her last hole and shove the pieces of him inside and cover them up. The earth will be clean again. As the women sink their teeth into the succulent oranges, they will watch as the fences disappear one by one and the soil all over the land will grow dark and wet. She eats the orange with delight, her face and body warm. She blows out the candle, takes a deep breath, and climbs up out of the earth toward the sun. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> that was really beautiful. It, like if you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you look at the chat, everybody should look at the chat after they've read. <laughs> everybody's being so Thanks. wonderful and generous and, and just attentive Thanks. really not generous but attentive um in their comments and uh it's, it's a nice thing to do anyway please Thank comment you. in the chat um and uh i've turned on the captions because it's nice to read along um you know i find it, it's nice to to read along as well as hear it and cheryl um where can we get the Clarity of Hunger? Uh, Clarity of Hunger is available on buckshop.org and um, you can order it through a lot of bookstore websites um, and Barnes and Noble and Word West Press also um, has a shop, the publishers. Great. Thank Great. you so much. I, 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 have, I have my copy when I was... A few years ago, I, I did a panel. It's like the only time I'll ever do a panel at a AWP because it's just really hard, you know. <laughs> um, and I did it on the um, the hermit crab. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, of course, I went right to Cheryl Pappas, you know, because I consider you the queen of the hermit crab. You know, the hermit crab is a story in the form of something else, like a menu or a Yelp review or something. And you're just so right. good. Um, Thank you. That, that was beautiful. And thank Thanks you for so being much. here with us on thank the you. first garden, Cheryl. Cheryl I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, well, not only do we have great readers, but we have a wonderful audience. I just want, I always like to give a shout out to the people who've taken the time out of their day uh, to come and join us. Um, B. Lynn Gold, Goldwyn, who mentioned in, uh, if you look in the chat, she's got like a contest that she's mentioned there. Paliopi Palios. Uh, Alicia Decker, Luella Lester, Shara Cronwell, Claudia Montpere, Bill Merkley, Susan Grimm, Andrea Marcusa, Nasser Hajo, Caitlin Thornborough, Catherine Lawless, Cole Beauchamp, uh, Audie Ballou, uh, Allison Wassell, and Alana Vaintraub. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your names or if I left you out. Uh, please put that in the chat and I'll give you a shout out later. Um, because it's really, really nice. It's just wonderful. It's beautiful for you to come in and listen to to us, to take the time. Um, and I like to say, you're here because you're beautiful, and you're beautiful because you're here. So thank you all for being here. Okay, next we're going to move on to Jackie Doyle, Jacqueline Doyle. Uh, Jacqueline Doyle's flash chat book the Missing Girl is available from Black Lawrence Press. She is Flash published and forthcoming in Wrigley, Tramset, Midway Journal, Flash Boulevard, and Aquifer, Florida Review Online, among others. She lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Jacqueline Doyle. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Francine, for inviting me. And I didn't know it was your first anniversary. That's cool. And uh, all of you for being here and to all these great readers, Cheryl and others. 
Um, I want to read something today that I haven't read before, and uh, this is a condensed version of the title flash in my very long work collection in progress, The Lunatic's Ball. Um, the Lunatic's Ball is a segmented flash, and because you can't see it on the page, I've assigned a number to each of the four sections. One. I remember the name Greystone from my childhood in the 1960s, spoken in a thrilling whisper. It was the local loony bin for nutcases, fruitcakes, wackos, crackpots, maniacs. At slumber parties, our variants of the man with the hook urban legend ended with an escaped lunatic from Greystone, his hook dangling from the car door. Greystone Psychiatric Hospital in Morris Plains, New Jersey, housed well over 7,000 inmates when the singer Woody Guthrie was a patient there in the 1950s. By the 1990s, it was largely abandoned after reports of rampant patient neglect, sexual abuse by staff, escapes, and suicides. The buildings were later demolished. Gravestone, Woody called it. If she'd survived, would my Aunt Maddie have been treated at Greystone or someplace like it? She could have stayed on the lithium instead of detoxing on the advice of a quack chiropractor, or had second thoughts as the carbon monoxide fumes filled the garage, or have been discovered in time to save her life instead of three days later. She was only 47 when she died. Two. My mother told a story about a lunatic's ball that her mother attended, probably in the 1940s. Lunatic's balls for inmates, staff, and visitors were common in late 19th century insane asylums, less common later. It must have been at Greystone, not far from the town where my mother grew up and I grew up. Did her mother have a relative at Greystone? If so, my mother either didn't know or pretended not to. Maybe attendance was considered entertainment by small town middle-class housewives or a kind of civic duty. My grandmother danced with a charming, good-looking man who she assumed was a doctor. The punchline to the story was inevitable. He turned out to be a patient. A big laugh from my mother, as if no one in her own family could end up on a mental ward one day. When her younger sister Maddie was diagnosed as bipolar, my mother's main concern was that no one in town learn of it. Maddie's later hospitalization was a secret too, as was mine. My aunt was only nine years older than me and I followed her everywhere as a child, besotted. Maddie was the sister I didn't have, the mother I wanted when I was a teenager, generous with her time and gifts. Gorgeous, charismatic, wealthy, fashionable, outgoing, extravagant, high strung, sleek as a greyhound. My mother was jealous of all the time I spent with her, of her good looks and fancy house and wardrobe. She brought it on herself, my mother said after Maddie's suicide, lips pursed, uninterested in statistics about bipolars and suicide. My mother didn't believe in mental illness or witch doctor psychiatrist. She believed in moral judgment, particularly of those she saw as unfairly favored by good fortune. Three, we're the two crazy ladies in the family, Maddie said to me once. We were drinking Chianti at an Italian restaurant, laughing about something. I was in my late 20s then. It was before I got sober, before my own hospitalization and bipolar diagnosis. By then, Maddie would already be gone. When I look at the sketchy family tree my father started for my mother's family, there are so many names I don't recognize so much potential for secret afflictions. Who was my mother's Aunt Blossom, her Aunt Florence? I never met my mother's Uncle Tommy, an alcoholic who died in a hotel fire, probably a bowery flop house for drunks. The family said it was the First World War made him drink. It's a good man's failing, the Irish say, always ready to find a reason or excuse. Bipolar family trees invariably include more than two crazies. Relatives suffer, suffering from substance abuse disorders, mood and anxiety disorders, or schizophrenia. Scientists don't know why. There are plenty of alcoholics on both sides of my family tree. 
My mother didn't believe in depression, despite her chronic fatigue. She never acknowledged her father's dementia or her own. Thank God we've never had any of that in our family, she said. Are there other delusional relatives buried in our family past? Alcoholics self-medicating for mental illnesses? Relatives excused as eccentric? Madwomen sequestered in attics? There must have been more of us, hidden from sight or slipping off the family tree like leaves in autumn, unnoticed. Four. In my dream, they're playing Woody Guthrie's Cowboy Waltz, two patients sawing away on fiddles as I dance with Maddie at the lunatic's ball. The tables have been cleared away, the graystone hospital cafeteria festooned with red and green crepe paper. The Hawaiian punch mixed with ginger ale and large glass punch bowls is strictly non-alcoholic. Did you know that Bob Dylan used to visit Woody Guthrie here at Greystone, I asked Maddie. Woody said folk songs should comfort disturbed people and disturb comfortable people. Maddie laughs when someone shouts hee-haw and the sedate suburban matrons scatter, clutching their visitor name tags. Maddie holds my hand aloft and we execute a perfect turn before whirling across the dance floor. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. The other dancers are a blur. This is fun, I say, I should have come sooner. How many years has it taken me to join Maddie at the lunatic's ball? Fear of our dark kinship held me back. If Maddie and I were the two crazy ladies and she took her own life, what would my fate be? Could I risk joining her in public? What would happen if my colleagues and students and acquaintances knew I was also bipolar? But now that I'm finally here, I'm so glad to see Maddie again. The lights blaze, the Christmas decorations glitter, the musicians strike up a new tune on their fiddles. We twirl and spin, dancing, laughing. I'm not sure I ever mastered the box step, but it's all coming back to me. I let Maddie lead. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. My my internet just kind of froze you a little bit there. That's why I was a little hesitant. But thank you. That was um, such a, a stunning piece. Like not only were I mean the writing was just exquisite, but also the facts of it just chilling, really. Um, so beautifully read, beautifully done, and um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here today. Um, you, um, your chat book, The Missing Girl, is it available still at Black Lawrence? Um, it's still available at Black Lawrence, and they frequently have sales at Black Lawrence. So I want to push buying all of our chat books from the publishers rather than from that her terrible place, um, though you can usually <laughs> get them from your indie bookstore also if you... Some you can't, some don't uh, don't send chat books to indie bookstores, but um, so yes, I hope you'll, you'll buy it. Um, I wanted to say that I seem to have a Florida connection. I live in California, but my two forthcoming flash at the moment are at the Florida Reviews Aquifer and the South Florida Poetry Journal. Okay. Um, thank you, Francine. And my sure. heart just got a novella uh, uh, published by the University of Tampa Press. And I'm thinking we should move to Florida. They like us there. Then um, <laughs> things are happening in that state. Um, well, but the it, ironic thing about though is that is that I like I'm not in Florida. Right, you're in <laughs> but, but, city, right? but a lot of people have said that, like, oh, you know, it's like another Florida writer is like, no, I'm here in New York City. <laughs> right. But yes, right. well, yeah. Um, but nice to have you, Jackie. Really, as always, well, lovely to see you, and thank you for that wonderful story. Um, thank you. Okay, next we're going to hear from Mary Grimm. Mary Grimm has had two books published, Left to Themselves and Stealing Time. Her stories have appeared in the New Yorker Antioch Review and the Mississippi Review, as well as in a number of journals that publish flash fiction, including Helen, the Citron Review, and Tiferet. Her book of short stories, Transubstantiation, is forthcoming in November 2024, which is now, and you can tell us about that after you read, okay? Mary Grimm. 
Thanks, Francine, for the introduction. Lovely. And thanks, both of you, Meg and Francine, for um, for doing this, you know, of course, the whole thing, but also for inviting me to read. Um, OK, I'm going to read two flashes, um, which I hope are not too long. Um, the first one does not have a title. I think maybe the second one doesn't have a title either, but whatever. Um, OK, when Lexi's mother was growing up, things had been different. Sometimes the things had to do with money. Everything had cost less. Sometimes they had to do with the way children behaved. All they did nowadays, she claimed, was run loose and mouth off. Sometimes they had to do with sex, although the word sex was never mentioned. Lexi knew how to listen without comment, although that lesson had taken years to learn. Now, sitting on her mother's porch, she knew just when to put in a word. Oh, really? Or no kidding. Or just a mmm sound. They were drinking green tea with gin in it. Her mother's doctor had recommended green tea to her as a preventative against heart disease, and she had taken to it enthusiastically. When she drank it with gin, she called it her health cocktail. Who you been seeing lately, kiddo, she asked. Lexi took a long drink from her glass. Nobody. What about that guy? What was his name? The one who had all the dogs. Vincent. Vincent was a lawyer who had spent most of his free time entering online dog shows. Him. He wasn't so bad. That's over. Oh, honey, you should have called me. I know what it's like to get over a breakup. I was a wreck when your father hit the road. He was my stepfather, Lexi said. He was an asshole, is what he was. Next time, next time, next time, call me up. I'll come over, we'll have some drinks. We can sit around the table and trash men for a couple hours. You're assuming there'll be a next time, Lexi said. There's always a next time. Her mother poured some more of the health cocktail from the pitcher on the little table between them. You should have held on to that one guy who was a mechanic. What was his name? Joel? Him. He was solid. Do you ever hear from him? Lex Lexi took a long drink of her G&G. &G. He's dead. Dead. At his age, he wouldn't be more than 50 now, am I right? He's been dead for 10 years, Lexi said. And because she didn't want to talk about it, she said, what about your exes? You ever hear from any of them? All the time, sweetie. They can't leave me alone for long. You know how it goes. What do you mean about Joel? How did you find out? Lexi didn't answer. She had looked Joel up on Facebook on a whim and found his obituary, which mentioned his wife and two children and that he had died of cancer. She had been stunned, as if someone had broken into her house and hit her with a baseball bat. Joel, who had curly hair and dark eyes. Joel, with his long fingers. Joel, how he had looked up from under his lashes. Joel, who had brought an old car and fixed it up for her when she was broke, living on boxes of food her mother made her take home after every visit. He'd said he'd paint it for her and asked her what color, and she said green, but then she broke up with him. She'd almost forgotten what he looked like, but for some reason the car was clear in her imagination, although she had never seen it. Grass green, like no other car on the road. Her mother spotted the groundhog on the lawn who had been eating her lettuce and broccoli plants. She took off one of her shoes and threw it at him, yelling like a banshee. Take that, she said. You know, he reminds me of my mother-in-law. She used to waddle just the same way. She didn't waddle. Well, that's how I remember her. But what's this about Joel, sweetie? You know I always liked him. Lexi sighed and held out her glass for a refill. Um... Okay, the second one, um, I retired a little while ago from teaching in a university, and it was really a lovely experience, and I loved it, which um, maybe you can't totally tell from this next bit, um, which is, it was written with affection. At the faculty meeting, the minutes were read and objected to, and then revised and folded up into a very small packet and eaten by Professor Ryder, whose turn it was. The agenda directed that we should now turn our attention to old business, but Professor Jade begged to announce the results of her personal best footwear contest first. Uh, let me interject and say that all of the professors here have been named after uh, soap opera characters. Best men's went to Professor Brick for purple and green high tops, best women's to Professor Eden's see-through platforms. Professor Eden responded by parading up and down to show off the shoes and her bare but suntanned legs. Professor Tinker objected that he would have worn more interesting shoes if he had been apprised of the contest. Professor Jade explained that it was spontaneous, a natural response to the sterility of their environment, the ragged carpet, the stained metal bookshelves half filled with yellowing and outdated journals, 
the flickering fluorescent lights. Professor Tinker said that nonetheless, he would like next time to be apprised of a possible shoe contest or a contest involving any kind of outerwear whatsoever. A motion was made and seconded that a memo would be sent out supposing the occasion arose and voted resoundingly in. Hey, we do old business now, begged Professor Slade, who was the acting department head and had been since the unfortunate incident in the quad. There were murmurs and cries of assent from those who were paying attention. In the meantime, the usual things had been going on in the back of the room, including a drinking game where we did a shot every time Professor Jinx said, as I have always said, or every time that Professor Slade mentioned how things had been done at Fordham when he was there. The department secretary, secretary came in just when we were getting down to old business and said that it had been her birthday last week and no one had remembered. We waited respectfully through her crying jag, tactfully cut off by Professor Jade, who led her to the woman's restroom. Professor Slade asked that someone take responsibility for this next year, and we promised that we would, while not meaning it in the slightest. There was a 10-minute discussion about whether a motion to forbid the grad students from taking outside employment had been tabled or sent back to the grad committee, which ended by the appointment of a new committee to find out the truth of the matter headed by Professor Bianca, who had been on sabbatical and so would have all the shit jobs for the next few months. She was also charged with the revision of a memo on the mood of the grad students. Should it say that the grad students were completely happy or that they were happier than they had been? Professor Eden suggested that we might say the worries of the grad students have been greatly palliated by the attention of the faculty, which was voted on and put in the record. When it was time for new business, there was a motion to table the very important discussion of which of the three unsatisfactory candidates we should hire, one too old, one too young, and one having disturbing pale gray eyes that most of us felt were sociopathic, and to go right on to planning the department spring reception. Professor Serenity complained that as a vegan, she had often had only baby carrots and raw broccoli to eat and that her teeth weren't up to it anymore. Professor Slade reminisced briefly about the parties at Fordham before the turn of the century where the only things served were good scotch and potato chips. Most agreed that gluten and dairy-free options should be included and it was voted in with two abstentions. The youngest faculty members, assistant professors Gina and Cruz, were passing notes back and forth, which may or may not have included caricatures of their elders and betters. And because of that, and because Professor Tinker's dog, Thug, had begun to bark and paw at the door, there was a motion to adjourn the meeting. Wow, what, what fun, Mary. <laughs> Mary Grimm. Um, so Mary, tell us about your book, your new book. Um, I have a book. I'm going to say, I, I was going to say coming out, but you know, I think maybe it actually might be out possibly because it's listed in a couple of places. Um, it's called Transubstantiation, um, which is, I guess, a nod to my Catholic background. Um, and I'm kind of regretting that I named it that because, um, you know, I keep misspelling it when I'm typing it. It has so many, it has so many vowels in it, you know. Um, but anyway, it's coming out and it's a book of short stories, not flash, but, you know, sort of more normal sized short stories, I guess. And I'm pretty excited, but I haven't actually seen it. They haven't sent me copies yet. Well, we'll keep, we'll look for it. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And um, yeah, it's, it's coming out. Sorry. It came, it's coming out from CNR press and it's on their website. Oh, great. Okay, great. If you want to even put the link in the chat, that would be great. And okay. um, thank you for being here with us at the press garden, Mary Grimm. So um, I want to just say, if I may, I think, are we bringing it? I think we're bringing it. <laughs> and the good news is we have four more powerhouse readers. Like if you can stand it, if your head is not going to explode, stick around. And I'm going to turn it over now to the other half of the Prose Garden, the wonderful Meg Pokris. Meg, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Francine. I really wanted to thank you all for being part of our first anniversary reading. It's been so wonderful to co-host this series with Francine, who has the amazing, amazing hosting skills and makes every event feel special. And um, what a warm and supportive community of writers we have here, I think, especially during this really terrible time. 
um, it's a huge comfort to be part of this exceptional group of really talented people and, and brilliant spirits. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, so next up is Jeff Friedman. Jeff Friedman has published 11 collections of poetry and prose, including his most recent Broken Signals from ba Bamboo Dart Press, August 2024. His work has appeared in Best Microfiction, New Republic, Flash Fiction Funny, Poetry, and American Poetry Review. He has received an NEA Literature Translation Fellowship and numerous other awards. Welcome, Jeff. Oh, I got to unmute. Mute. I forgot that. I was going to pantomime this. It would be like one of the stories that you and I wrote together. I'd mime my whole reading. Um, it's great to read with the Prose Garden again. And this is a wonderful reading series. So thank you both for inviting me. Appreciate it. Um, my new book is Broken Signals, as you, as you mentioned. And I actually had a book that came out not that long ago called Ashes in Paradise that was out about less than a year ago. So... Um, Broken Signals is a, a, a smaller book. It's a chap book. So um, I'm going to read a few pieces, um, I think. Okay. I'm going to start with a piece called Remembering My Father's Face, which is in Broken Signals. Actually, it's the first piece in there, uh, as I recall. And there's a reference to um, a song called One for My Baby, but sung by Frank Sinatra, that my father, who was a salesman, used to always misquote as he sang it. So... Um, anyway, um, that's about all. This was published in DMQ Review originally. Um, remembering my father's face. He died in the 80s, by the way. Lying on the couch, my father disappeared like smoke through an open window. Not even his impression on the pillow remained. He had died 40 years ago. I tried to remember what he looked like, but whenever I thought of him, I could only remember his tight, black, curly hair, his rounded shoulders, his pained feet, not his face. I tried over and over again to picture him. I saw him carrying his suitcases up the staircase, his gray fedora tilted forward so I couldn't see his face. I saw him start his electric shaver in his white undershirt, but when he lifted it to shave, there was no face in the mirror, only a bright burning light. I heard him singing, it's a quarter to three, there's nobody here. His face, a blur of chalk, an erasure, a wind lifting leaves and straw. When the leaves fell, there was only dust and air. Um, the next piece is um, a piece called Chopsticks, and that appeared originally in Switch Online and then in Best Microfiction 2024. I started to say 4044, but we're not quite there yet, so. Um, anyway, chopsticks. How he loved remembering that she had been in love with him, kissing him suddenly while they sat at the piano, playing chopsticks together. She didn't remember that, kissing him or being in love. I would have never played chopsticks or any other song with you. I never learned to play the piano, she said. He took her hands in his and looked into his, her eyes. We were lovers, he said. I just met you, she answered. He led her to the piano and helped her sit down. We've been married a long time, he said, taking the spot next to her. She closed her eyes, thinking about what he had just told her. But when she thought about lying down in the bedroom, she couldn't picture him beside her. When she thought about the living room, he was not in it. Nor was he with her when she walked the neighborhood, stopping to admire the purple flowers and the burning bushes. Nor could she place him in the garden, nor could she feel his lips kissing her tenderly on the cheek. As he began to play chopsticks, her hands moved up and down, but didn't touch the keys. Um, the next piece appeared in New World Writing, and it's in Ashes in Paradise. It's for a friend of mine who, um, about 10 or 11 years ago, um, got a mysterious disease that turns out was related to ALS, and she's gradually deteriorated. She was an artist. So um, I'm going to read this. The singer who lost her voice. The singer lost her voice. And though her lips were perfectly shaped around syllables, only breath came out. For seven days, she remained silent, gargling salt water to soothe her throat muscles. When she attempted to sing again, her voice wouldn't sound. 
No matter how much effort she exerted, she couldn't coax or force it out. So she made an appointment with a specialist who nodded knowingly, winked at her, and told her not to worry, that her voice would come back when she didn't expect it. After a long period of time, she didn't expect to hear her own voice anymore, so she thought that as the doctor predicted, it might return. Yet it didn't. Then she went to a healer who poured warm oil down her throat. The oil soothed her throat. There was more silence. She found a witch online who said it was a curse. The witch created a spell to remove the curse that had stolen her voice. I can see her voice in the air flying toward you. Can you see it? The singer shook her head. Open your mouth and let it in. Something might have flown in her mouth. She didn't know. She closed her eyes and sang. Her song was soundless. The palm reader traced the deep grooves of her palm and said, you will sing again, but first you must live like a bird. What did that mean? Build a nest and live in a tree? Eat only seeds and nuts? Learn to fly? She moved her arms as though they were wings. She ate her food in small, quick bites. She puffed out her chest, threw back her head to sing, but couldn't even produce a whisper. Then she found a guru who had the answer. The guru prayed and chanted. He burned incense. Go home, he said. Drink this tea every night and chant these words, and you will sing. Night after night, she drank her tea and chanted the prayer silently. Then one night, she stood in the mirror, a glint in her eyes. Her voice would return now. She was sure of it. She began to mouth one of her favorite songs. White butterflies streamed out, landing on the glass. Then out came rays of gold dust particles and hidden fears. The mirror clouded, then cleared. The song fell back into her throat like water swirling down a drain. She walked out of her home and looked up at the clear white moon. She steadied herself, inhaled the darkness, and from her lungs and chest, she pushed the song out with all her might. Thousands of sparks flew into the air. Um, I think I'll just read one short, sort of lighter piece, so I feel a little bit less, I, I feel like the lightness will, will come back to me if I read a lighter piece. So I'm going to read a piece called Newman's Own. And um, when I was growing up, I was a great fan of Paul Newman. And um, okay, Newman's Own. My lover thought I was Paul Newman, which is probably why she became my lover. One night in bed, I told her the truth. I'm not Paul Newman. She started to laugh. You're a joker, all right, she said. No, really. Paul Newman has blue eyes that are clear as skies. I've got dark, beady brown eyes, Hungarian eyes. He has a square jaw and I have a weak chin hidden by my beard. I've never made love to Liz Taylor or Dominique Sanda or Joanne Woodward, and I don't drink two six-packs in two months, let alone two hours. Well, she said, your tomato sauce is pretty good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. I love Paul Newman too. Those were wonderful, wonderful stories and beautiful images. It was so much fun to collaborate with Jeff when we wrote The House of Grana Padano, which came out from Peloponnesus in 2021. Um, Jeff, where can we buy your most recent book, Broken Signals? Can you post uh, a link us in the chat? Well, okay, I'll, I can put, um, I think Bamboo Dart is probably, the. it's available at a number of bookstores. I know that, but yeah. not my area, like still North or, our um, Norwich Books, Yankee Bookshop, but um, probably just go straight to um, Peloponnesus and Bamboo Dart. That would help Mark Givens, who's a wonderful editor, and Dennis Palacci, both of whom are wonderful. So I just put that in the, the chat. That'd be the best place to get it, I think. That's great. Thank you so much. Next up is Kat Gonzo. Kat is a Boston-based writer and professor of the practice at Boston College. Her work has been published in Smoke Long Quarterly, New Flash Fiction Review, Hobart, and others. Welcome, Kat. Hi. Um, thank you for having me, uh, Francine and Meg. Um, I am going to read a story from Smoke Long. It is called Puberty. 
It has been three days since my 14th birthday, since my dad unexpectedly picked me up after track practice and told me he was taking me on what he called a mystery ride. I'd never left Cleveland, never been on a plane, and despite all that, 22 hours later, I found myself wearing the same polka dot underwear and sharing a thin, hard co cot with my dad in Croatia, the place my grandmother had always bragged about escaping. And when I asked if I can call my mother, dad says, you're on a boat. And how the hell are we supposed to make a phone call? It's a good point. There are men on the boat. They smell like salt and sweat. And my dad keeps joking with them that I am not a woman yet. I wonder how he knows the men. I watch them peer over the side of the large boat, the waves of silver tuna streaming past, unable to go far, contained by nets. The men wear orange raincoats and stand over a mound of small dead fish. Dad tells me to pick one. I point. They slip black gloves over their thick hands. They stab the fish with hooks and swing them into the water. They catch one almost immediately. Dad helps the men pull the heavy tuna from the water. It is a fighter. It brutally slams into the floor until one of the men takes out a small metal device and pounds it into his forehead and the fish stops moving and blood spreads across the deck and puddles around my shoes and streaks the faces of the men. Again, I ask if I can call my mother. How much do you think you'll get for this, dad asks the men. They tell him a number in Croatian that I know is large because he claps and says, good, good. I think the men can speak more English than they let on. The men peel the thick skin off the fish with a sharp knife. The meat is pink and fatty and raw. Dad takes a slice between his fingers and wiggles it in front of my face. I'll never eat tuna again, I say. We'll see. You know, I have an algebra test today. Who needs algebra when you have all of this, Dad says, tossing his hands into the wind. I tell him I am supposed to go bowling with Kim after school. I tell him about biology lab tomorrow and how my teacher will fail me. She won't take Croatia as an excuse. The men continue to capture and hit, capture and hit. The blood reminds me of the oval stain on our beige couch, the one my mother scrubbed, pretending it was red wine. My dad says, add a girl, slapping my back. There are white ridges in the flesh of the fish. They seem like they will be tough and harsh, but are not. The men place slices of the fish on their rough hands and hold them out to me, offering more, and I take it. Okay. And then this next one, I'm sure everyone can relate. The story that you love that is in a magazine that no longer exists. <laughs> uh, so this was in Korean. Um, and I love it. All right. Izzy stole Maria's night guard. Maria said it isn't important to study because when we are older, they will, they will live in California. And all anyone ever does in California is eat avocados and swim. Izzy thought Maria might be wrong. But the teachers forgot to take attendance and eighth grade was stupid and Cleveland was stupid and she couldn't wait to get out. So she kicked her French book under the bed and spent all her time with Maria. At the movies with Maria, riding bikes with Maria, flipping through Victoria's Secrets catalogs with Maria, eating fortune cookies with Maria. Each afternoon, Mo Baker, a 10th grader, whistled at them from his stoop on Euclid Ave. Maria hollered back in a thick Spanish wave. Izzy didn't know what they were saying. Her mother told her not to be friends with Maria. At Maria's, there were moths that sprung out of flour and half-eaten cans of Vienna sausage on the countertop. Izzy and Maria wagged the sausages at each other like little swords and tossed potato chips on the floor and stomped, blaming the mess on Benito. They closed the blinds and the curtains and their eyes. They lay down on the carpet in the dark, head to toe. They whispered about the future, about eating avocados in California. After a heated negotiation, Izzy's mother let her spend the night at Maria's every other Friday. She made Izzy call home three times, after school, before bed, after breakfast. Before bed, Izzy and Maria brushed their hair. They giggled as they checked each other for lice and scoliosis. These were the games they played. After they brushed their teeth, Maria grabbed her night guard from its glittery purple case and popped it in her mouth. Izzy called her the quarterback. The night guard was cheap from CVS. And though the fit was loose, her molars had dug ridges into the thick, hard plastic. Izzy would fall asleep listening to the soft click of Maria's jaw. One Saturday morning, Izzy told Maria, uh, excuse me. One Saturday morning, Izzy took Maria's night guard. 
Izzy knew Maria had a crush on Mo Baker and Mo Baker had a crush on Maria. And she thought about these truths as she slipped the night guard into her backpack. Maria's father used to tell them to watch for tiny moments with huge importance. He called them sky openers, when God peeked down for a moment to watch. He told them that, the, that weddings and births and falling in love were sky openers, but little things mattered too. The first time you bought your own groceries or rode a bike down a hill so steep you thought you might never stop, but you did stop and you were okay. He said his greatest sky opener was coming. He thought his boss at the factory might promote him to manager. Then he would take them all to Myrtle Beach, Benito, Maria, Abuela, and Izzy too. Instead, he was laid off and he moved them all away. After that, Mo Baker didn't talk to Izzy anymore. She didn't eat fortune cookies or little Vienna sausages. There was no one to check for scoliosis. Sometimes at night, Izzy removed Maria's night guard from its glittery purple case. She pushed it towards the roof of her mouth, but no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't make it fit. Her mouth was not Maria's mouth. Her teeth were not Maria's teeth. Her mouth was much too small. Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. Those were amazingly powerful pieces. You write young characters so brilliantly. Thanks so much for being here with us. What a treat. <laughs> Next up is Lynn Mundell. Lynn Mundell is editor of Centaur and co-founder of 100 Word Story. Her writing has been published in Tin House, Booth, Smoke Long Quarterly, Best Microfiction, a W.W. Norton anthology, and elsewhere. Lynn's chapbook, Let Our Bodies Be Returned to Us, was published by the University of, of South Carolina in 2022. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for this really great um, series. I really enjoy it. So thank you. Um, I'll read one story. It's called Shoeless. Um, it was published um, last year in Wigleaf. And Jackie knows this one. So Jackie, you'll have to hear it again. <laughs> Shoeless. One, The Kitchen Counter, Annapolis, Maryland, 1972. Her mother is on the phone shouting at Mrs. Bobeck. Lou was eight. She didn't know what she was doing. At mother's elbow, she watches her doodle a two-headed monster with devil's horns on her shopping list. Through the telephone line one block over, ants carry Mrs. Bobeck's voice. The girls swapped and we're not a family to go back on our word. Frida's yellow jelly sandals fit perfectly. When she moves her feet in a little dance, the tiny silver sparkles inside the sandals wink up at her. It was a good trade. The black and tan saddle shoes had reminded her too much of school. Sitting still, finishing projects. Remembering something Frida's sister Charlene once said, she whispers to her new shoes, you are bitchin'. With one fast hand, mother reaches down and gives her a sharp slap across the face. At the same time, she slams the, the phone down on Mrs. Bobeck, who's saying the friendship was never a real one anyway. Two, next to a fountain, Lithia Park, Ashland, Oregon, 1980. When she opens her eyes, there are the people from yesterday, Cedar, Padre, Jason, crammed into two sleeping bags zipped together. She always sleeps in the heavy wool serape she wears also to do her shopping. She lost her boots last night. She remembers a man with a beard in three braids decorated with clay beads, a tiny blue pill on her tongue, and then nothing. These are the little families, there are little families in the park this afternoon. The fathers and kids don't seem to see her like she's become the ghost of a ghost. But the mothers watch her. They look at her like her own mother did with a mixture of anxiety, dismay, and fear. An old couple is waiting in the creek. They hold hands as they slip on the rocks. On the grass, they've laid out a gingham tablecloth, a picnic of sandwiches wrapped in wax paper, apples and cookies, as well as their shoes and neat pairs sturdy brown orthopedic creepers with black socks stuffed inside 
and blue tennis shoes embroidered with little red flowers. As the couple wobble away to the opposite bank, she swoops down and bundles the whole shebang away into under her serape. Then she resumes walking away from everything and everyone who may possibly remember her. Three, beauty shop station number five, Central Women's Correctional Facility, Gatesville, Texas, 1994. She is very careful when trimming Big Berta's flat top because she is not someone you want to provoke. Red trimmings fall on her slip on canvas shoes, which are a dead tooth gray. Big Berta suddenly sees, heaves herself up from the deep leather chair and lumbers away wordlessly. This is the least boring prison job for the low offenders. When she'd finally been caught, it had been for a crime so poorly executed that the guards gave her the nickname everyone uses, Sleeping Beauty. She'd broken into a motel room and after helping herself to the mini bar and cash, had taken a nap on the queen bed. It had been such a long time since she'd slept on a mattress. That night at the police station, she put the few possessions that were actually hers into a big plastic bag, including the two small purple stilettos a rich guy named Dwayne had just given her. She never told anyone that between stuffing her pockets with bills and sleeping on the clean white sheets, she knelt by the side of the bed and prayed for the first time since she was a little girl. Four, cash register. Second Chances Animal Welfare League, Eureka, California, 2016. It is never routine. She sells beat up paperback romances, unread autobiographies, secondhand wedding dresses, cracked number one teacher coffee mugs, rejected accent pillows, outgrown dolls, unnecessary fish tanks, and unused, wi unused wigs. She listens to marital problems, job woes, and money issues. Sometimes she undercharges. In rare instances, she gives things away for free. The thrift shop's purpose is to fund the adoption of the abandoned animals in cages in the middle of the shop. And to that end, she cleans, waters, feeds, grooms, and pets. She's adopted a one-legged chihuahua named Sissy a geriatric pug called Romelda, and an entire litter of flame point Siamese she can't tell apart and just refers to as the kids. Yesterday, she'd been unpacking the latest donations when she'd opened a garbage bag and on top found a pair of never worn red leather tap shoes with black satin ribbons for laces. They were her size, seven. She'd written out a tag for the maximum shoe price, $10, and had Sally ring them up and put her money in the till. While she'd reorganized the used stuffed animals and thrown a birthday party for a declawed tabby called Philip, the shoes had called and answered with her every step. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was absolutely wonderful. That one-legged chihuahua. Oh my <laughs> God, it was a declawed tabby. Oh, I really enjoyed that. Thanks so much for being here. Um, where can where can we find your collection? Uh, um, <laughs> it was published by a literary journal called Yemisi, which um, ended its um, publication of chapbooks after um, it published me, a really uh, insane poet who hijacked um, the reading that we had and kind of went postal. And so <laughs> the end of the series, oh. and then Yemisi this is unrelated, um, rebranded itself Cola. So the only way you can get it is if you dig through Cola's website, you have to have a submittable account, which isn't helpful to like my mother. So I'm going to recommend if anyone would like my chat book, um, I'll put my, my, uh, website in the, in the uh, chat here and just, you know, I'll send it to you. I'll sign it. I'll reduce the price. And so that's probably easiest. That sounds like the way to go. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry about that. It's, yeah, it's, it's life in the flash awesome. fiction world. <laughs> it really is. Oh, I'm so sorry, Lynn. Okay. That's great. Yes. Everybody contact Lynn directly. Next up is Pamela Painter. 
Pamela Painter is the award-winning author of five story collections. Her stories have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies and have been included in Best Microfiction, Best Short Fictions, and has re received four Pushcart Prizes, most recently for a story in Alaska Quarterly Review. Welcome, Pam. <laughs> Here I am. Thank you, uh, Francine and Meg. What a great year you have had. So happy anniversary. And um, today, tonight's stories are, are really, the, what a wonderful collection. I don't make comments. My keyboard is acting up, but um, I have joy, just enjoyed all of them. Um, you know, written down phrases and uh, just wonderful stories. So I'm going to read two stories. Um, the first was in uh, Flash Boulevard, uh, edited by Francine. And this story is called Close Your Eyes. <clears throat> I was in kindergarten when I realized that when my friends heard close your eyes, they fully expected something wonderful to appear or happen. Up to then for me, it was what my grandfather said when he was about to do something dire, like the time he stuffed six newborn kittens into an old flour sack or put a limping dog out of its misery. The squirming flour sack was carried to the weedy pond on the edge of the farm. The dog was settled into an old suitcase that Grandpa shot five times. Sally, close your eyes, is what my grandmother commanded before a mouse, its tiny feet stuck to a cardboard square, was dropped into the rain barrel. I always closed my eyes, though it was no protection at all. So when Danny's mother sang close your eyes at his birthday party, my first birthday party that wasn't for a relative, I yelled, no. I feared for their scruffy dog barking its lungs out in the pantry or the ratty cat scratching the leg of the table holding the birthday cake. Two kids giggled. Danny's mother said, good heaven, Sally, don't you want to be surprised? I did not want to be surprised. But I looked around the room decorated with balloons and shimmering streamers. My friends all had their eyes closed, some with fingers pressed, pressed tight, others squinting hard above wrinkled noses, not an ounce of dread. I closed my eyes. Seconds later, it seemed like an hour, Danny's mother sang, open your eyes, excuse me. Mm. <clears throat> I kept mine closed, ready for screams of dismay or horror, surprised by my friends' yelps of delight. Mm -mm. There stood a magician in a fancy black suit and top hat. He bowed low to us, sweeping his top hat in greeting, and he was seemingly shocked when a bird flew out of his hat and fluttered onto his shoulder, very much alive. I thought, now it's going to go all wrong, but instead everything was all right. The disappearing penny was fun. The silks, Mr. Padini called them silks, kept swimming out of his sleeve, and his bow tie squirted water at the birthday boy. We all sing happy birthday. We were happy, except that a stomach ache kept me from eating my slice of birthday cake. I'll just say this, that first lesson was hard to unlearn. And uh, the second story uh, is a really new story. I'm still kind of vaguely working on it. <clears throat> um, not vaguely, I'm still working on it. <laughs> so it's called Revenge. Seconds before the accident, I felt it coming, is what I tell the policeman whose siren blaring showed up with two ambulances and three police cars minutes after the accident. I admit I knew it was going to happen. I knew my car was going to swerve into their car to run them off the road, their car now upside down and bent over the railing, its doors leaking booze and broken teenagers being pried free and lifted into ambulances. Minutes ago, their car was upright, paused next to me at the red light, filled with drunk teenagers swigging half-empty bottles of vodka or gin. They were giving me the finger, revving their engine as if to entice me, someone old enough to be their grandmother, into a senseless race. It was the sort of car with the sort of passengers I suspect I've been looking for, waiting forever since my son's death a year ago. Exactly a year ago, another car packed with teenagers 
celebrating something stupid with half empty bottles of vodka or gin swerved into my son's car, filled with his family coming home from a day at the shore where he was teaching his daughter how to swim. I tell the policeman, I didn't know I wanted revenge, not in so many words, till the car with drunk teenagers pulled up beside me at the red light and suddenly I saw red, not liter literally, but well, yes, officer, you can take me in. Thank you so much. Um, they're wonderful. Oh my goodness. Um, what a delight. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, if you want to put links to your any of your collections in the chat where people can buy your your previous collections, please do so. Um, but don't you know people can I know you can people can find them just by by looking you up, obviously. So um do you do you want to put a link to, to my 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 uh keyboard is acting up so i haven't made comments okay. about any of the wonderful stories don't, don't so, worry yeah, yeah. Never, mind. never mind yeah okay okay all right thank you so much for being here um i will turn it back over to you francine oh thank you meg um so i you know i want to say that after doing this for this first year um one of the things that i think you know meg and i have always been <clears throat> excuse me most uh, most um, <clears throat> impressed with or surprised by is the quality of the people that we ask. You know, we'll invite readers that was like, should we ask them? Like, they're, they're so good, you know? <clears throat> and they say yes. <laughs> and we're like constantly delighted by that. <clears throat> and because really Meg and I can just do so much, it's the readers who really you know, round out the show, really make the show. Um, so I want to thank all of our readers today and the readers for the past year. Um, and, um, but most importantly, I want to thank Meg for having, like together, we just kind of came up with this idea, like, oh yeah, let's do a reading. Like, yeah. And um, we keep thinking, yeah, okay, um, great, we'll do one more month. And, and so here it is. And I think now we can safely say we're going to continue the Prose Garden for as long as you'll have us. <laughs> and um, it's been really fun working with you, Meg. So uh, thank it's you. It's been a blast working with you too. I've had yeah. such a good time. Me Meg is so like, we really make a good team because I'll be sort of like, okay, let's do it this way. Which um, like is my teacher training. Let's do it this way. And Meg is always like, yeah, okay. So she's great, you know. I, love I know it. I'm. I'm a pushover. I'm a total pushover. Well, you have great ideas too, so you know it's it's wonderful. It's just a nice, very nice collaboration. Um, I'm not surprised because Meg, you are. I I would dare to say the queen of the collaboration. You you've authored books with so many people. Yeah, and I love it. it. I love it's working just something with, yeah. that you're so good at, you know, and you do workshops with people. So. Yeah. This is just an extension of that. But so I want to thank today's readers, um, Catherine Silverhajo, Cheryl Pappas, Jacqueline Doyle, Mary Grimm, Jeff Friedman, Kat Gonzo, Lynn Mundell, Pamela Painter. You were all wonderful, a delight to hear. I I don't put comments in just because I'm a little too nervous while I'm hosting, but um, they, you know, I mean, let, let's just say the fact that you're here was a testament to how much I love you all. So um, if you can just accept that as, uh, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, I'll be putting the recording up uh, later tonight or um, but maybe tomorrow. And um, I know some of you will want to replay this, even if you've been here. Um, and I'll post it on Facebook and uh, even the other place, which, you know, I posted Flash Boulevard on on Twitter. And I think like I got two likes, which just shows, yeah, it just shows how it's kind of, you know, <laughs> like the empty it's like just emptying out. So um yeah, well not surprisingly. I can share I can share the recording on Blue Sky. Um because I'm yeah, on there. Yeah. I'll do that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And also, I, I just so you know, I timestamp the readings. So um, when you when you go to YouTube and it says like a little description of like, you know, monthly reading, and then it says more, hit more, and then a list of the readers comes up. And there's like a little number next to it. And you can go right to your reading. Or you can tell your friends, I'm at, I'm at 2218, you know, uh, because of course they'll want to go back and hear everybody else, but they might want to hear yours first. Okay. Um, so just so you know, anyway, um, so um, with that, I'm going to sign off and um, it's been a wonderful afternoon. I thank you all for being here. And um, as I always like to say at Zoom readings, drive carefully. From New York City, I'm Francine Witt and Meg Pocus in the UK. And thank you from the Prose Garden. Shall we stop recording?